This is a 2017 Mercedes-Benz G65 AMG. No, I did not mean to say G63 AMG or G55 AMG. This is a G65, which means it has a 6-liter twin turbocharged V12 with 621 horsepower and 738 pound-feet of torque. It starts at $222,000, and it's shaped like a file cabinet. Before you ask, no, this is not some weird modified thing created by an aftermarket tuner. You can walk into your local Mercedes-Benz dealership, the same place that's offering a $349 a month lease deal on the CLA to a first-year PR person who just graduated from SMU, and you can buy a V12-powered SUV with the aerodynamics of a refrigerator. This is the single stupidest car for sale today. And that's why I chose to rent it here in Los Angeles using Turo, which is this service that lets you rent other people's interesting cars instead of normal boarding rental cars. You can sign up for Turo using the link in the description below. Now today, I'm gonna show you around the G65 and I'm gonna show you its quirks and features and then I'm gonna get it out on the road and find out what it's like to drive this impractical box with a supercar engine, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the G65 experience, go to autotrader.com slash oversteer. Now, before I start with the quirks, let's just discuss the ultimate quirk. This car was originally designed in the 1970s as a military vehicle. There is an early version of this vehicle with a four-cylinder diesel engine that made 71 horsepower and 101 pound-feet of torque. I'm not kidding, the 240 GD. Now, over the years, it's started to become cool, the boxy styling, the capabilities, and so Mercedes-Benz started to add features, and then they made it a little bit more refined, and then they updated the styling a little bit, and then in 2002, they started selling it in the United States. Then the Kardashians got like 20 of them, and now here we are, a 40-year-old design SUV with the engine from a supercar that costs as much as a condo. And if that wasn't enough for you, on to the other quirks. Now I'm gonna start up here in front, and yes, this is what it looks like when you cram a V12 into a vehicle designed in the 1970s. Take a look at this thing. It looks like the engine is trying to punch its way out of the engine compartment. It is absolutely massive. And as much as I think this vehicle is absolutely ridiculous and stupid, I have to admit, it sounds pretty good. Take a listen. just be this vehicle's only redeeming capability because the first thing you notice when you spend any time with a G-Wagon is just how old and ancient everything is and in some cases the absurd lengths Mercedes-Benz has gone to cover that up and make it seem like it's brand new. Now keep in mind as I show you these things that in order to buy one of these you have to pay something like $230 thousand dollars. That makes it ridiculous that it doesn't have, for example, keyless access where you can just leave your key in your pocket and open the door. This car doesn't have that. A Toyota RAV4 has that. In this car, you got to take the key out, unlock the doors, and then climb in. Now that may seem a little nitpicky, but this isn't. Take a look over here and you can clearly see the door hinges. In every other car, they've covered them so the unsightly hinges are out of the way. In this car, they're visible and fully exposed. Same goes for the hinges in the hood and the hinges on the rear tailgate which I'll get to in a moment. And if you're not put off by the exposed hinges, then take a look into the door gap. Look at all that stuff you can see in there. Every other car, the door gap would be one-tenth of this size, and it would line up flush with the body. In this car, the door is fully closed, and you can see everything in there. It looks unfinished. And yes, before you ask, the door was completely closed when I filmed that. It's just an ancient design from a different time period that no one would ever allow in a car today. And speaking of that kind of thing, let's talk about the screws and the lights. Take a look here at the turn signal, which is mounted on the fender because they can't fit it in the headlight, which is just an old school circle. The turn signal 
has screws in it. So does the front reflector. In most cars, it's just this little plastic piece that pops in and pops out, but in this car, it has visible screws. Same thing with the reflector in back. It's just like there's sort of an afterthought that were added later, and that's incredibly obvious. That's a running theme in this car, and maybe nowhere is it more obvious than the backup camera. Now, all cars by law must have a backup camera starting next year or something like that, but this is a luxury car. Everybody expects a backup camera. Some are Mercedes had to fit one. Now, most automakers put the backup camera by the license plate, which is usually here. But this car has a rear-mounted spare tire, like older SUVs and trucks do, so the license plate had to go down here, which left them in a bit of a conundrum for where to put the backup camera, and so they stuck it here. Now, this is just embarrassing. They didn't even try to conceal it. It just sticks out there like a little hump where this car's tail used to be. It's absolutely ridiculous. And the most ridiculous part is not the placement of it, although that's close. It's the fact that because it's up there, when you actually shift into reverse and try to use the backup camera, half the screen is taken up by the tire. Take a look. You actually back up and what you see is some of what's behind you and a lot of tire. Now, since I'm around back, it's worth noting that the tailgate is probably the easiest way you can tell this vehicle was simply designed in a different era. For example, every other car in this class has a power tailgate. You walk up to it, you push a button, ding, ding, it opens for you, but this car has a rear door, and so they couldn't make it power operated. And that isn't the most old school thing about it. That honor goes to the simple weight of this thing. I wish you could feel this piece. It is absolutely massive. It is a very large door. Basically, it spans the entire height of the vehicle, plus it has a piece of glass in it, plus it has a full-size spare tire and a spare tire cover on it. It has to weigh over 100 pounds, maybe even more, and I could see a lot of G-Wagon owners having trouble opening or closing this thing if they were parked on a hill. And when you get inside here, you discover yet another old-fashioned G-Wagon characteristic. At some point while this car was being sold, all governments all around the world started to mandate third brake lights, not just the two on the sides, but one at the top, so Mercedes had to figure out a place to put it, and of course there was no place to put it outside the car, so they just kind of tacked it onto the window. And then they decided they needed to put parking sensors on this car, and Mercedes displays parking sensors in an odd way. There's a little display in the front and the rear of all of its vehicles that sort of shows how close you are, and Mercedes-Benz tacked that on to the third brake light. And so, for those of you playing at home, this was initially just a rear door. Then they put a spare tire and a decorative cover on it. Then they put a backup camera on it. And then they had to put a third brake light on it and a backup sensor. And I'm sure this leather was added at some point and I bet it wasn't always tinted. And so over time, this thing has just gotten heavier and heavier and more unwieldy as this car has gotten more and more luxurious. Another interesting thing in this car, you see these lines lines that run all along the top of this car, well, those are gutters. Just like your house has a rain gutter, so does the G-Wagon. Now, a lot of modern cars have rain gutters or rain channels, but they're usually carefully hidden within the bodywork. This thing, they're fully exposed, just like really old school cars. And if you get up in there, you can sort of see the path that water takes as it lands on your G-Wagon. It's ridiculous to see this in a modern car. One old school feature in the G-Wagon that I absolutely do love, that would be the sound the doors make when they close. It's this old school click you just don't get in modern cars. I hope it comes through on camera. Take a listen. Doesn't that sound great? The doors close with so much more stability and purpose than in a modern car. But then there's also one major problem with the doors, probably the biggest problem with the entire G-Wagon, and that's the fact that the windows are completely straight up. Now, that's part of what gives this car its cool, boxy, military look, but it also creates a huge problem. When you're driving down the street, what is seen in one window is reflected on the other side because that window acts as a mirror since it's basically 90 degrees. So if it's out this window and it's here, 
it's reflected on that window. The result is that if you're in the middle lane and a car is passing you on the left and you glance to the right, it looks like it's passing you on the right. Eventually, after enough time owning a G-Wagon, you get used to this, but initially it scares the hell out of you. You go to make a right lane change, you think nobody's there, you start moving over, and then you freak out because the car on the left of you looks like it's on the right of you. It is truly maybe the most dangerous thing about this car and one of the worst design elements of any modern vehicle. And next up, let's talk brakes. Usually when I'm reviewing a V12 twin turbo car, I'm always commenting on how the brakes are massive and they look insane and they're bigger than the wheels on some cars. In this vehicle, yeah, not really so much. Look how tiny they are. I know these are 21 inch wheels, but still they're so small. And look at the brakes in back, they're even smaller. This is not a small vehicle. Can those brakes stop this car? Next up, moving on to some of the ridiculous old school design touches in this car in the front, starting with the parking brake. Now in most luxury cars, there's an electronic parking brake, just a little button or tab you pull. In this thing, there's still an old school handbrake and it's still mounted directly next to the driver's knee. Now you might be watching and say, well, I want an old school parking brake. That's what I like, it'll never break. But remember this thing is $230,000 and it just looks so unsightly. But apparently Mercedes-Benz can't put it anywhere else. Next up, here's a hilarious one. When you sell a new car in the United States, you have to put a warning decal on the airbag to let people know that their small child could be injured by the airbag. In this car, there's not enough space on the dashboard facing the passenger where they can put that label because the design is so old. Instead, they have to stick that label on the windshield. So the airbag warning in this car is stuck to the inside of the windshield. You will not see that in any other vehicle. And then there's the cup holder. Mercedes-Benz simply does not have enough room in the interior of this car to stick a cup holder, partially because they can't move that parking brake. And so the cup holder in this car is sort of a random afterthought tacked onto the center console in the passenger footwell. And it's hilarious. It looks just like a basketball hoop. It is the basketball hoop cup holder in the Mercedes G-Wagon. They all have this. This isn't aftermarket. Mercedes installs this from the factory. Now, little known fact, there are two additional cup holders in the G-Wagon. They're in the back. Now, while the back of a lot of $230,000 luxury cars has a nice screen in the middle or some sort of center console that folds down and lets you control all sorts of things, this car, well, it just has those cup holders. They sit there in this little plastic case that can be removed. And when you remove it, you will find that it is the single cheapest part that has ever existed in a $200,000 car. It's also another great example of an afterthought since this thing just comes out. They couldn't even bolt the cup holders down. Back up front, I love the fact that the glove box in this car is still basically the same one they were using in the 1970s. It's this plastic crappy thing. You open it up and there's a couple of cutouts where you can put drinks or military canteens as that was probably what was supposed to go there in the first place. Another stupid old school touch. How about right above the steering column? It used to just be open here and you could see through and see the steering column itself and nobody cared because this was a military vehicle but on a $200,000 luxury SUV that won't do so Mercedes stuck this piece of leather there to hide it. More old school ridiculousness that shouldn't have made it into the modern era. How about the passenger side grab handle? Now this grab handle was placed here so that when you were in your military G-Wagon back in the 70s, driving through the jungle, trying to kill the enemy, your passenger had something to grab onto as you ran over tree branches and stumps. Now, 40 years later, this grab handle is still on here. Even though this is now a V12-powered luxury SUV that costs $230,000 and rides on 21-inch wheels through Beverly Hills. Noting this irony, Mercedes decided to add a little carbon fiber strip to it. <laughs> Next up, I want to talk fuel economy. Now, owing to this car's massive engine and its boxy design with no regard paid to aerodynamics since it's from a different era, this car gets abysmal fuel economy. The EPA rates it at 11 miles per gallon city and 13 miles per gallon highway, making it the single least efficient car 
on sale today. And honestly, I haven't even been able to achieve that. This is the fuel economy number that the car tells me I've been seeing as I've been driving around. Now, I know the kind of people who buy this car can afford to buy fuel forever, and they don't really care about the gas mileage, but 11, 13, getting 10 miles per gallon as you drive around. I realize you can afford it and you don't really care, but at some point, don't you just realize that you're a complete f Okay, uh, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, next let's talk about differential locks. Now I wanna tell you, despite the fact that this car has gotten a reputation as being the vehicle that hauls around the Kardashians to appointments and shopping, it is still regarded by the off-roading community as probably the most capable factory off-roader. One of the reasons is its differential locks. It's the only car you can buy with three locking differentials from the factory. It allows you to lock the front wheels so they spin at the same rate, the rear wheels so they spin at the same rate, or all four wheels, which is tremendously impressive, and it's highly useful if you get stuck off-road. Now, you probably wouldn't want to do that in the V12 version with 21-inch wheels, but you could still do it in a G-Wagon. Now, I have to admit, I find it absolutely hilarious that the differential lock controls are still the most prominent thing in the center control stack, because let's be honest, they will never be used. No one who buys this car even knows what they do but that's what they do. And when this thing is used in 20 years, someone will take it off road and someone will appreciate those buttons. I also like the fact that Mercedes is still sticking the warning label right below the differential locks telling owners never to engage them on paved roads. Don't worry, Mercedes. I don't think anybody who buys this car is ever gonna press any of those buttons. A few other items of note, how about the fact that there are several blink switches in the center console and a few more in the center control stack, even though this is one of the most expensive Mercedes models currently on sale. And then there's the interior, which is beyond tasteless. Diamond stitching and red leather on the door panels, up and down the entirety of the front seats, even on the rear door panels and all over the rear seats, including the middle seat. It's like an Italian restaurant where the mob would have gone to in New York City in the 70s. Admittedly, I do like all the storage areas. This net below the glove box is handy, and I like that the front door panel has not one, but two areas where you can store stuff, which is nice and practical. Less practical is the location of the door lock button, which is truly interesting insane. It's not in the center controls. It's not on the door like most cars. It's not Oh wait, it is on the door. You just can't possibly see it or reach it with the door closed. Open up the door and you can find where Mercedes hides it. But with the door closed, you can see you'd never know it was there. And this isn't some feature you'd never use. This is the door locks. Okay, so those are the quirks and features of the G65, but let's not get carried away. The biggest quirk is that this thing exists at all, followed very closely by the experience of driving a V12 file cabinet. So now I'm gonna do that. All right, driving the G65 AMG, and I've been driving this car around all day here, and I gotta be honest, it's a terrible car to drive, truly a terrible car to drive. Let's start with steering, all right? It is absolutely the worst steering of any modern vehicle in existence. It is incredibly vague. It doesn't really respond that well to your commands. It's too light. There's no on-center feel at all. I mean, I can move the wheel. Look how much I'm moving it this much, and the car is going dead straight, but that's not the problem with the steering. The problem is when you're in the middle of a corner, it can tighten up or loosen up randomly, and it's just, oh, now it's tight. It's so bad. I can't believe that a modern vehicle exists with steering like this. And then, and then, as after you've turned and you're already starting to straighten out, it's like the car continues along its path until you're almost that straight. I, <laughs> It's like they've updated all this other stuff and they stuck all these other things on this ancient car to make it modern and they never touched the steering. Next up, we need to talk about the visibility situation. The mirror reflecting in the windows on either side thing. Uh, I tried to mention before, this is a crazy thing about this car, but it's hard to overstate how obnoxious and annoying and dangerous it is. Um, it's like you're in a, a carnival funhouse, like I said. Between the steering and the windows, that would simply, I would just not buy the car. And it's funny because I had this car, not the 65, but the regular G550 on the, my list of cars I was considering when I bought my AMG station wagon. Um, and I called my wife when I got here to California and I told her, uh, I am so glad. <laughs> 
I did not buy the G-Wagon. And then there's another part of the driving experience which I think doesn't get covered enough, and that is simply how people look at you and feel about you. This car can only be driven by people who just have no shame in their appearance and their social standing and that sort of thing. I think there is a perception that when you're driving this thing, you're a total jerk and some rich jerk, and the kind of people who drive it are like, yeah, whatever, I don't care what anybody thinks. They can just have, that's their problem. And I don't behave in that way. That's not how I feel. So I just, I, I couldn't t tolerate sort of the, the social ostracism that would come from driving around in one of these vehicles. To me, that's a shame because there are three huge reasons why I would love to have a G-Wagon. Number one is off-roading. I love to go off-roading and this is basically the most capable SUV on the market. Number two, uh, these things hold their value unbelievably well. A 2002 G-Wagon from the first year of sales in the United States is still a $30,000 plus dollar car. A 2002 Range Rover, which would have cost about the same at that time, is worth whatever you can find some mechanic who's willing to give you for it. Very few cars keep their value like a, like a G-Wagon. The other reason that it's annoying that I can't get one of these because of the social stigma is that it's perfectly sized. Now, when you look at a G-Wagon, you have the uh, initial feeling you're gonna say, oh, that thing is such a big car. Oh, you have to be, so, oh, it's such a big SUV. No, it isn't. A G-Wagon is narrower in width than a Ford Focus. This car would be the perfect size to drive around a city. And I live in a big crowded city and this would be the perfect SUV. All, all other SUVs are larger, wider, longer. Now, are there good things about this car? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> there are a couple of good things about it. One is it's super nimble. Now that's surprising because it's it's super tall and weird and everything. And, and I always kind of wondered, you know, can you actually use that power? Well, yeah, you can. You can actually kind of dart around in this thing. Um, you have to kind of figure out how the steering is going to respond because it's very weird, but this car is actually more nimble than you might expect. If you're on the highway and you need to make a quick lane change, you can do that. Drop the throttle and it, it zoop. You can kind of zip around because it's just so much power. Even though this car is, is heavy and, and bulky, it, when you put enough power in anything. Another thing I like about this car is the styling. I mean, let's be honest, it's so cool looking. I love boxy SUVs. The XJ Cherokee, the old Range Rovers, SUVs have all gotten so so flowing and I hate that stuff. SUVs should be boxy, off-road, trucks, practical, brawny, burly, and that's this thing. In the end, I think there are pros and cons. The cons are the social image, fuel economy, the, the price, the performance is good, but barely better than the G63. The steering is terrible. The interior is outdated. One thing I will say, as you watch this video, in like three weeks, they're gonna show the brand new G-Wagon, supposedly at the Detroit Auto Show. So there will be a new G-Wagon, and it will get rid of a lot of that stupid stuff while keeping, hopefully, the boxy character. And so that's the G65 AMG. I'm gonna tell you right now, do not buy this vehicle. It is utterly idiotic. The G63 AMG, which by the way is also idiotic, starts at $144,000 and does zero to 60 in 5.2 seconds. This car is 80 to $100,000 more expensive than that, and it does zero to 60 in 5.1 seconds. The fuel economy rating is 11 miles per gallon in the city and 13 miles per gallon on the highway, making it the single least efficient vehicle on sale today, according to the EPA. The interior is ancient. The driving experience is terrible. It is an utterly pointless waste of money. You should not buy this car. You should not consider this car. You should not want this car. You should not like this car. And yet, I'm glad I had a chance to drive this car because it is a rolling monument to crazy a big square rolling monument that's shaped like a shipping container. Time for the Doug score. This should be fun, starting with the weekend categories and styling. I don't care what you say, I like boxy SUVs, I'm sick of curvy SUVs, I think the G65 looks cool, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 5.1 seconds, so it gets a 5 out of 10. Handling is awful, unpredictable, ancient, and tremendously dissatisfying. It gets a rare 2 out of 10. Cool factor depends on who you are. You see one of these climbing the trails in Moab, and it's an easy 10, while you see one of these parked outside Fashion Island in New 
Newport Beach with the driver screaming at a store employee for ordering the fuchsia coat instead of purple, and it's more like a negative 50. I'll split the difference with a little extra for the 65 because it is a ridiculous crazy car. It gets a 6 out of 10. Importance would normally be low as this is a run-out model made to sell a few more G-Wagons before the upcoming redesign, but I predict in many years we'll actually look back at this car with awe and stupefaction at the fact that they built it, and it may even gain a cult status. It gets a 6 out of 10, bringing the total weekend score to 26 out of 50, and meaning I would rather drive around on the weekends in a Prowler which is true. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. The G65 has a lot of modern stuff, like a nice center screen, ventilated seats, whatever, but it's also missing stuff it just should have, like that power rear tailgate. It gets a 7 out of 10. Comfort is good, even with these big wheels, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality, I have to say, is mediocre. It feels like a tank, sturdy and substantial, but it's bad form to have the freaking warning labels visible through the door crack, and who knows how a twin-turbo V12 will be to maintain over time. It gets a 5 out of 10. Practicality is normally based on cargo volume, and with the G65's big cargo area with the seats folded, it deserves a 10, but I can't give that score to a car that gets 10 miles per gallon. Still, its large cargo area and relatively small usable size means it gets a 9 out of 10. Finally, there's value. The G63 is already a weak value at around $150,000 with all these flaws, and I truly can't think of any reason why anyone would want to pay another 80 grand for a G65, a aside from just having that V12 badge on the side. I've never, ever done this before for the value category, but it gets a 1 out of 10. Add it up, and the total daily score is an abysmal 29 out of 50, tying it with my 12-year-old Range Rover with 120,000 miles. Add it all up, and the total Doug score is 55 out of 100, which is surely the worst score for a new car that costs this much money. Honestly, I'm surprised it even scored that high.